Hello, and welcome to episode 006 of Well, That's Interesting. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jill Chacha with the amazing, talented, award-winning, twice over, Marissa Riley. Hello, it's so good to be here. (laughs) The very talented Jill Chacha. Oh, my God. Um, Hey, everyone. So, great news. Marissa's film, uh, the short comedy horror film, just got into a new film festival. Why don't you tell us about it? It sure did. Um, it is a mouthful to describe <laughs> my film. I had to I had to make a whole Instagram for it. Pretty short film. Follow it. Um, and uh, describing it as like it's a horror comedy short film. <laughs> Some people describe it as a micro film. Um, but I just got into the Austin After Dark uh, festival and I'm so excited. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's going to be a drive-in screening, right? In drive-in Austin? screening. It's going to be great. Um, and I'm super pumped about it. I don't think we're going to go, but to stay safe during these COVID, COVID times. times. But I'm excited that they are showing it in a way that is safe um, for yeah. viewers. Yeah, so check so. out Marissa's new Instagram for pretty. Uh, and all the details are there. Uh, we also have an Instagram well, that's interesting pod. Uh, we have an email address. Well, that's interesting pod at Gmail. Uh, please send us your facts and things you want us to know. And it could be anything uh, about you, your, a, an experience you had, that you learned something from it. Um, totally. Also, okay. also still shouting out to people who want to give us their favorite Britney song, especially if it's not... <laughs> One of her singles, like, of course you love Toxic, but if you like another one, if you like Touch of My Hand, if anyone has ever heard that song, it's a very sexy (laughs) song. It was not released as a single. It's about um, something great. So, (laughs) Do your analysis of it. Yeah, we're... Uh, we're drinking coffee this morning. Yes, so. <laughs> no tequila today. <laughs> I, re- I listened to the episode. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's definitely tequila in that episode. So yeah. thanks for, <laughs> if you listened, thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk, uh, we have an incredible episode today. Uh, but right before we get into that, I want to bring up uh, a fact someone sent in, James. Uh, he wrote, quote, Sigmund Freud researched cocaine by experimenting on himself, swallowing 0.5 to a tenth of a gram at a time, uh, while gifting coke to his friends and fiancée Martha. Uh, His studies on the drug were published in an analysis titled Uber Coca in 1884. Uber Coca. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Put that on a tote. Yeah, and I looked looked into it further, and uh, apparently... That was Sigmund Freud's first published paper. It was on cocaine. Oh, wow. So he just sent, like, to put that into other terms, he's just a cokehead. I think yeah. um, by those standards, a lot of people have published papers on coke. Basically, all you have to do is do coke and talk about it. Yeah, we're all, we're all scientists, basically. So send us your facts. <laughs> send us your Uber coke facts. <laughs> send us your Ubers. Uh <laughs> Or go to Narcotics Anonymous. It, it's up Whoops, to you. sorry. <laughs> oh, this show. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about um, a story. Uh, this story is about a man hell-bent on destroying a small town with a modified bulldozer he welded together in secret. Yes, my friends, it's the Killdozer Rampage of 2004. Holy shit. Yeah. Now, I had no idea about this story. Uh, it is long, it is complicated, it's bureaucratic, but it is, it is worth it. Now, I saw a jaw-dropping documentary on Netflix. This is how I learned about it. It's called Tread, T-R-E-A-D, and I highly, 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 highly recommend watching it after you're listening to this podcast because you need the visuals. We're going to do our damn best to describe this killdozer, describe what this man did to this very small town in Colorado. Tiny. Very yeah. tiny town. 1,300 people and one fucking bulldozer. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this podcast is based on this documentary along with uh, some sources on Wikipedia. Um, all right, so let's, let's first talk about 
the man behind the wheel. Yes, please. Marvin Hemeyer was born October 28th, 1951, in South Dakota. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. He found his calling as a welder at an early age. And as a young adult, he joined the Air Force, working on engines and motors. Uh, he was stationed in Colorado, and he decided to stay there uh, after being discharged. So, nice. Yeah. Nice know. state. Nice Beautiful choice. state. You know, talented. Talented guy. Talented. Normal. Yeah, right so, now. as far yeah. as we know. <laughs> right now. Right now. Uh, he took a job at a muffler shop and quickly arose ranks uh, until there really was nowhere to go um, but to open his own business, Marv's Muffler Shop in Granby, Colorado. Can I be honest? I mm. really want a t-shirt from that muffler <laughs> shop. Is that crazy? <laughs> like, no, it's, that'd be a cute tee. It, it, Is it, that the silliest thing? I, okay. I, we can, Don't we can design me. one. Fuck it. Let's Fuck design it. it. I feel like that's such a classic vintage tee that we'll, you'd we'll find d- at we'll Buffalo design one for the, for the merch store that I have yet to open. Please stand by. Please stand <laughs> so by. So many designs. It's going to be just... so good. <laughs> so we're going to, you know, fuck Marv. Uh, I'm going to be really hard on him because uh, he's a piece of shit who uh, turns out he's influencing other pieces of shit. So oh. I'm going to be real hard on him. Sorry. Sorry, Marv, but we're going to rip off your muffler shop. Fuck you. Okay. So by all accounts including Glenn Trainer, who uh, was the Grand County Undersheriff from 1993 to 2004. Marv was damn talented uh, and produced great work for his clients. Uh, his early life in Granby was social. Uh, he was part of a snowmobile club that would ride out every Thursday. It was a heartwarming bromance collective called oh. the Thursday Crew. Oh, my God. I know, adorable. It's adorable. And, yeah, they... By all accounts, these guys loved each other. They were just, uh, every Thursday, no matter how big the group was, two guys, four guys, up to 20 guys, they would just go out there and just, like, bro out and just, you know, be social and be normal. Let me let me stop by saying, yeah. like, everything up to this point, he sounds so nice. Yeah. He sounds like a, like a chill uncle or something. Yeah, why don't you take a look at his photo and describe what he looks like. Okay, okay, I'm pulling up the photo. And I do know what's going to happen, so it's, like, hard to hear this. He looks like, he looks like a normal, not creepy uncle. Right. Like, he looks like, like he'd work on your car and then leave. And that's it. (laughs) And then he would not overcharge you you and then just be like, all right, have a good day. And then... Let's move on with our lives. Right, yeah. He's also kind of forgettable. He's like... He is average, pretty forgettable. White guy, you'd never... Like, if there was, like, a police sketch, I hate this, it would just look like anybody. Yeah. Slightly you know? balding, some facial hair, but honestly, like, when I look away, I can't describe it again. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. So, so, that's... That's Marv. Marv. I mean, his fucking name is Marv. Okay, yeah. where are we? Thursday crew. Uh, so, he was social with his... He had buddies... Uh, he dated a woman named Trish McDonald, who to this day smiles when talking about him and their oh, time together. Oh, wow. Okay. She describes him as old school and held up his side of a gentleman's agreement. So he was a handshake kind of guy. So Aww. he uh, lived by his word, and boy, howdy, he definitely kept his word. We're going to have some quotes oh, no. from him about the things he said. Um, he made personalized steel bumpers for each of his fellow riders for their... Uh, sm- snowmobiles so oh, that's, that's really cute very cute so he took his time he had attention he was creative uh and maybe a little bit obsessed about creating things uh on the face of it nice guy uh but that's just the face of it right right um now with a lot of narcissistic men who feel society is flawed and has done them wrong and they feel denied they feel slighted in some way or another uh like most of these men um they document their feelings and their rationales and their philosophies. Some write long letters uh, that they send to newspapers. I don't know, like the Zodiac Killer or the Smiley Face Killer. <laughs> you know, these, these types of men. Uh, and Marv was no different. He, um, he recorded his, uh, his injustices on audio cassette tapes, very old school. He had about, uh, by all accounts, I think it was about... A little over two hours worth of ramblings. Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, now, you see, Marv didn't like the town of Granby as much as the regular folk of Granby kind of liked him. Uh, and why is that? So we're going to, Marissa, if you can All right. do me a solid. Rolling and, up uh, my sleeves. 
just read one of many quotes we're going to read uh, from the mouth of Marv. Okay, all right. So again, this is a quote from Marv, not for myself. <laughs> <laughs> good, uh, good uh, what do you call it? Intro, yeah. intro to the <laughs> yeah. quote. Yeah. All right, okay, here's Marv. All right. It's a kind of community that in order for you to get ahead, you have to keep the neighbor down. Not build yourself up on your own merit. It's tear the other guy down. There you go. How was that? That was award winning. <laughs> More award winning shit from Mercer <laughs> Riley. <laughs> I'll post my laurel later. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's aggressive. Uh, he, feel, he feels like the only way to get ahead is to tear, tear, the, other tear the other guy, guy down. down. Now, his feelings probably began when Marv bought the land where he developed his muffler business. Uh, it was at an auction for foreclosed properties. Uh, a lot came up for a 3,000 square foot building on two acres at a very reasonable price, $35,000. Nice. Right? Marv bid 40. Okay. Uh, now, another dude was there, Cody Docheff. All right. All right. Cody's very integral to this this story. Uh, he was also at the auction, and he was looking to expand his own business. He had his own dreams, living the American dream. Uh, he had a concrete business called Mountain Park Concrete, and he wanted to build a new factory. So he was already pretty successful, and he wanted to expand. Uh, but his budget was capped at 50000 and Marv bid a little more than Cody, and he got the plot. Okay. Okay. So he got what he wanted. Uh, nice. Yeah, that I mean, great. doesn't seem like anyone's holding him down here. It seems like Cody got a little fucked over, but yeah, but that's uh, just what an auction is. You yeah, bid somebody, and Marv Marv got what he wanted. Um, this is a pattern. We're gonna see where Marv get what's what he wants, but he still doesn't think he got what he wanted. So. Oh my god! <laughs> so what happens next in this story is all he said, he said, and what was said, you'll have to find out. After the break. Oh! Hey, buy this product. Do it. Sponsor us. Do it. Hello, everyone. You may recognize me as Gabby from the History of Everything podcast. And my name is Bruna, and you don't recognize me from anything yet. Together, we're two scientists who explore all of the weird little questions and conspiracies of the universe in our new podcast, Mystery of Everything. Everything has an explanation. We hope. But that is what we're here to figure out. We will dive into the science behind many popular conspiracy theories, such as vaccines causing autism, flat earth theory, and was the moon landing fake? And if so, why the heck would anyone even do that? But it's not just conspiracies. There's a lot of cool mysteries that we will attempt to use science to explain, such as near-death experiences, what made the Vikings go berserk, and can I control my co-host with MK Ultra? Wait, what? <laughs> anyway, make sure to check out the Mischief Everything podcast everywhere where you find your podcasts. Hello, everyone. It's Takuya here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. Hey everyone, Jill Chacha here from Well That's Interesting, and I am absolutely thrilled to tell you about Spotify for Podcasters. I use it, I love it, and it all started by downloading the free Spotify for Podcasters app, which has all the tools you need in one place to record and edit your masterpiece of a podcast. Spotify for Podcasters also distributes your show to all major platforms. So when you hit publish, your episodes will stream not only on Spotify, but I'm talking about the Apples, the Googles, Stitcher, Good Pods, the other ones. <laughs> You get the idea. And you can monetize your podcast with no minimum listenership required. You could also set up monthly subscriptions and record ads just like this one. So what are you waiting for? Download Spotify for Podcasters today and start changing the world. Oh, and please, stay interesting. Oh my God, we're back. We're back. We're back and 
products, man. They were delicious, amazing, helpful. Mm -hmm. So healthy. So healthy. <laughs> I slept like a baby. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, kept, kept me regular. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So we're talking about um, the auction Marv and Cody were at. Now, according to Marv's account on his audio, Cody got all up in his face and yelled for a good 10 minutes in front of everybody. Uh, but okay. we're going we're gonna to get back to that supposed confrontation in a bit. Put a pin in it. Uh-huh. Now, the land Marv bought was basically a concrete slab with just a tank holding gallons and gallons of raw sewage. Oh, no. Uh-huh. And you can't dump sewage anywhere. You mm -hmm. can't. You mm -hmm. just you can't do it. you got to connect your business to the city's sewer system, to the water, there's a water line. You know, we're, you're, we're, we're somewhat civilized. I'm, uh, I'm big into that. But questionable? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So to do this uh, in Colorado, you go before the Granby Town Council to get your permit and you pay. Sounds easy. Sounds easy. Very easy. Very straightforward. Every other goddamn business does this. Um, in the meeting... It was disclosed that the closest sewer main for Marv was hundreds of feet away from the property, and it would cost up to eighty thousand more dollars to build a line and connect to the city's infrastructure. Yikes! Marv is pissed to hell and would rather shit in a bucket than connect to the sewer system. Uh, Marv felt Ron Thompson, he was one member of the city council, was deliberately forcing Marv out of the community due to the pricing and the demand to basically run his business to code. Uh, now, Thompson, the Thompson family, uh, goes back generations in, in uh, Granby. Uh, they have an excavation business. They own a lot of property as well. So they're well-to-do in Granby. They're, they're very, fancy. They're very, very well-known. Uh, like names, I'm sorry, roads are named after the Thompson family in this, um, in this small ass town. So to be honest, now I kind of don't like the Thompson family. <laughs> <laughs> so how does Marv feel about the powers that be, Marissa? Tell the folks. Again, this is not me. This is uh, Marv. Okay. If the powers that be, if they were to let me alone, I wouldn't have this righteous anger, in all caps, that I have <laughs> towards the Thompsons, their hierarchy, their attitude, that they lived in that community for so many years, and so many people think they do. Screw your neighbor! That's right. End quote. End quote. Screw your neighbor. Screw your that's neighbor. What, that's what he believes, uh, is the Granby way. Now... Uh, interesting that he feels that, uh, he's being screwed because Marv is still able to open his business and run his business. Sounds great. It's totally fine. Uh, despite not being up to code, he does pretty well. Um, like we said, uh, he had clients, they loved his work. In fact, uh, he's pretty popular in town. Um, so Sounds his business nice. is doing very well. Uh, <laughs> He was able to build his own house, uh, from what I recall. Um, he even uh, built himself a hot tub, and he was able to indulge in his snowmobile habit. So I'm not going to lie. This sounds like a, not a best case scenario, but like a pretty good case scenario. Yeah, he, he's, uh, I would say, the classic American dream. You start your business, uh, you have friends, you got a girl. Pretty good. Um, but... Marv holds a grudge, especially against Cody, against the Thompsons, okay. of course. Now, he's pissed but stable until 1998, <clears throat> when this kind of go, starts going off the rails. Now, the town of Granby starts selling off property by a way of something called spot zoning, so little areas for sale. And uh, Marv believes this method is illegal, but no one in town protests sales in, in this manner. Um, now, uh, I'm sorry, let me just, so the, um, oh my God, I lost my place. Ah, bear with me. Mm -hmm. Now, the land just south of Marv was for sale. And guess who buys it? Our man, Cody Docheff. Oh, shit. Right behind Marv. So 
this entire time, Cody's been trying to find property that he could afford. And stuff so happens, it's right next to Marv. And for Marv, that's a little too close to home. Mm. Uh-huh. Well, uh, uh, I get it. It's <laughs> close, too close to... Okay, yeah. okay. okay so, <laughs> so now the townsfolk are like, hold up, a concrete factory near all of these homes, it's unhealthy. So the townsfolk, their point of view is, again... We need to sort out before you start building this concrete, uh, this concrete factory. So the town takes him to court, and Marv is like, "Hold up, I just hate the guy." So he joins the lawsuit. <laughs> what? <laughs> and he raises as much hell as possible under the guise of safety. Uh, and this uh, this event uh, went into the summer of '99. So it was a lot of back and forth, but the sale is approved with a lot of conditions to make this factory safe for the workers, for the neighborhood. So all this nitpicking by Marv actually got Cody to look good um, because oh. he agreed to all the regulations, all the citizens' concerns. He was actually negotiating, and he looked like a good businessman. He cares. And, yeah, he wants, and, and he wants a successful business that makes people happy. Right, because the people who are going to buy his concrete are the people in the town. So he's like, I'll whatever do you guys need. whatever you need, I'll do it. So Marv's plan backfired. Oh. Yeah. So... Marv runs and confides to his tapes the, with some rambling comparison and explanation that animals protect their young and their territory with violence and aggression. So just imagine how a man would react when cornered because he feels Cody is too close. Too close. Too close. His business is too close to Marv's business yes. as though they have anything. They're two complete businesses, different businesses. Um, Marv is in a bad place mentally. He's paranoid as fuck. His ego is bruised. And to top it all off, um, this awakened the city council. They're like, oh, shit. Hey, Marv, did you ever hook up to the (sighs) sewers? We know you're operating. We know you're doing really well. But haven't you connected yet? And nope. So from 1999 to 2003. Holy shit. Yeah. Marv is fighting the city council until a judge... Is like this is ridiculous. He orders his business closed, uh, and Marv needs to shut until he's connected or pay a hundred dollar fine each day. He's in operation. Oh my god! Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Marv feels like a rebel. Uh, he okay. wants to be this free spirit, this free animal. He wants to fight the system. Okay. Okay. Uh, he would rather pay hundreds of dollars in fines than put that money towards construction to bring his business up to code. God. Mm-hmm. I I uh, I want to say I get it because I'm always about fighting the power, but this one I'm just like, dude, this is your money. This is yeah your business, and it's it's just business as usual. It's just like, hey, you want to start a cafe? You need a toilet. Yeah, you kind of you know, do. If you want to wash your hands because you're in a muffler shop, I I don't know what he's been doing. When like I don't know what he's hooked up to to a bucket and some Purell. Right? I guess. I, ugh, I, I, I don't know. But anyway, he also throws his money into a lawsuit against the Dochefs in hope to stop construction of the factory. But it does nothing. Cody's, you know, he's got his own concrete. He's building the factory. He's, he's perfect. <laughs> he's doing his thing. Cody's the best. Also, Cody's, he's already hooked up to the infrastructure. Of course he is. Because it doesn't really cost that much uh, if you're a successful businessman like Marv is. Uh, so the factory is being built, and Marv is hemorrhaging money on the fines, on the lawyer fees, and he confides to a friend that he's already spent $150,000, which is almost double what it would have cost. Which would have been eighty eighty thousand dollars $80,000, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, Marv. Just Marv. trying to prove a point, and you're just digging yourself into a, into a shithole. Into a shithole, you know, literally. Uh, what won't dig you into a shithole? Reasonably priced products that sponsor this show. Let's hear about it. Let's do it. Stay tuned. Buy this product. Do it. 20th Century Studios presents Vacation Friends 2. Now streaming only on Hulu. Look at us all together again. We just wanted to give you guys a real honeymoon. Shots! 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 Now streaming. Shots! He was just released from jail. Where can I get a drink around here? Back on vacation. This place is nice. It's drug lord nice. I'm sorry, drug lord nice? 
with more baggage. Ever since he showed up, he turned this relaxing vacation into total chaos. Who does that? Vacation Friends 2. Rated R. Now streaming only on Hulu. And we're back. We're back. We're so uh, back. We're so back. Uh, I hope that was not sponsored by a uh, a muffler company. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> That would be very awkward. That would be odd. But if it was, I bet they were a lot better. Yeah. Better than Marv. Than Marv's. Yeah. <laughs> our, our muffler company. Better than Marv. Better than Marv's. Okay. Uh, speaking of Marv, uh, his lawyer tries to talk some sense into him. Good. Uh, right? Uh, and the lawyer refuses to appeal the court's decision of siding with the Doe Chefs, uh, which allowed them to continue operation and continue building their factory. Uh, at this point, Marv feels everyone is now, uh, quote, snickering at me. Oh, God. And that the town itself had the mentality of, quote, we'll get them. Now, why don't you read a little bit more from Marv's commentary? All right. Here we go. Okay. They started getting me in 1992. <laughs> I don't know what this voice is. Uh, when Gus Harris sold the property to Cody Dochef, they got me when they issued the building permit to Cody Dochef for the concrete plant and denied it was for the concrete plant. What are we all, stupid? I guarantee you I am going to make them deal with it. There you go. Yeah, I don't know what he's talking about when the city denied the permit was for the concrete plant. I, I don't know that part. That was, and agreed. It, that's, I think a sign. A lot of things are skewed in his head. Yeah. I will, I will say one thing, Yeah. which is, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with all the things he's saying, but I do like that. He is technically journaling. He is also yeah. very creative, very creative. I'm glad he's taking time to express his thoughts, even though in the end, mm. um, it's, it's, it's not going oh, you know, to go very yeah, well. Yeah, the journaling uh, goes off the rails. Hey! Off the rails. That's, oh. that's bad, bad pun. Yeah, come for the facts. Stay for the <laughs> bad puns. Uh, all right. So, defeated once again. Humiliated, in his mind, once again. Marv. Poor, poor Marv. He takes a fucking dip in his hot tub. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, God. Yeah, poor Marv and his hot tub. And Jeez. you guessed it, in his lowest moment, LOL, Marv <laughs> is visited, inspired, jerked off by God himself, and the plan comes to him. Oh, God. The plan comes to him in his hot tub. Uh... <laughs> he feels he's chosen. Uh, this vision, uh, ex- to him, explains why he's never married. Or never had children. It explains why he's so successful as a businessman. Oddly enough, he knows he's doing well. It explains his talents, right? Uh, The task before him needs to be done. And Marv is the chosen martyr to do it. Oh, no. Okay. Marv. 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 Hot tub Marv. I lost so... All right, why don't you... I lost so much respect for you. Okay. Last journal entry. (laughs) Oh, okay. Dear diary. Dear diary. Um, all right, here we go. Okay. The world will write stories about how wrong I am. <laughs> yes. So he knows he's wrong. He knows, he knows he's what wrong. he's doing. Yeah. He knows. Okay. More from Mark. Okay. How wrong I am. And without a doubt, I wish it could be done another way. But there is no way to make this right. You picked the wrong man. Right. Oh, Marv. Uh, you know what? I don't want your t-shirt anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they picked on the wrong man in Marv's eyes. Uh, now he even admits he's been boiling longer than 1998 to 2003. Uh, he says he's been boiling for about 13 years, which is a very long time. Wow. Okay. Uh, but let's get out of crazy town for a moment. We'll get out of Marv's head and we're going to, we're going to talk to, uh, talk about some witnesses now let's go back to that auction uh the auction where marv bought his uh property yeah uh, where he wanted to develop his muffler business now 
this is where supposedly Cody gave him like a tongue lashing and flipped out in front of everybody. Well, when questioned by the Granby Sheriff, Gus, who was uh, one dude with him, and Cody confirmed it never happened. Okay. Witnesses say there was no argument during this auction or after the auction. Uh, when Cody built his factory just south of Marv, Cody, like I said, hooked up to the city and water sewage lines. Uh, and he actually offered Marv, hey, look, I hooked up the hundreds and hundreds of feet. Why don't you hook up to my line? I'm right across the street. That's the re- work's been done. That's so just, really nice. It's really, really, yeah. It, the work's been done. All he had to do is maybe 100 feet of line, but... So that would have been like maybe like 10,000, 20,000, even less? Yeah, it just, definitely less than 80,000. Def- much less. But, you know, uh, ego. Uh, Marv does not take up Cody's offer. Uh, and it turns out Cody... I'm sorry. It turns out Marv had a lot of ways to get out of this and a lot of opportunity to end these supposed battles with the city, with Cody. Um, and also, Marv does some weird shit. Like, he offers to sell his two-acre property to Cody twice. Uh, and Cody was ready to file the paperwork, but Marv backed out every time Cody said yes. Because, uh, yeah. What? It's so strange. Marv could have had $375,000. Cody was willing to buy him out for that much. Uh, That would have covered the original sale, all of his losses. But, no. That's so nice of Cody. But also, like, Marv, Marv, come on. Marv offers. Marv offers. And then declines. Very strange. Uh. Very strange. Uh, In the summer of 2002, Marv heads to California. I, I, <laughs> I miss California. Uh, so, yeah, in the summer of 2002, Marv heads out west uh, to another auction. These goddamn auctions. Um, Marv, get away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he heads to a bulldozer auction where Whoa. he purchases his vessel. Oh, God. A Komatsu D355A. Now, if you close your eyes okay. and imagine any bulldozer you've seen at a construction site... It's pretty much that. Okay. All right. Uh, the Komatsu is about 13 feet tall. It's about 30 feet long. And the blade itself is 14 feet across. So it is a it is a nice size dozer, man. Let me tell you. A dozer. Yeah. He puts it on a flatbed and he drives it all the way back to Colorado. All right. And to avoid suspicion, Marv puts a for sale sign on the blade to suggest he's reselling it for profit. Uh, and in fact... He kind of suggests he's retiring because he puts the muffler shop, the two acres, and the dozer up for auction. What's with these goddamn auctions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I even wrote that in my notes. Now, in his head, it's some weird test of God. Like, he says, if he sells his package deal, like all the things, for $450,000, it's a sign to end his rage and move the fuck on. Oh my god, someone... I, I know. Yeah. Okay? okay? So this is another weird test in his fucking head. So that was summer of 2002. In the fall of 2003, Marv is offered $400,000. Yep, there's another way out of this. Pretty good. And he accepts the money. Okay. He Yay. gets the deal. Uh, but he doesn't include the bulldozer. Okay. Mm. Does he get the money still, though? Yeah, so... Marv believe God is behind the plan that it must go forward because the property was sold, the two acres, um, the everything was sold but the dozer. So he believes this is another sign of some sort. Oh, God. So, to, like, to go ahead with it? Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if the guy who bought the land didn't want the bulldozer or if uh, Marv denied selling the bulldozer. That's not clear, but... Everything but the bulldozer is sold. Travis Buss, I believe that's how you say it, B-U-S-S-E, is the man who bought the land from Marv. Uh, He needed space for his trucks, uh, so he builds a huge garage over the two acres. And get this, he offers Marv private space to park his dozer. That's so nice. Everyone is so nice to Marv. (laughs) Why is he so mad? He's got something going on. Yeah. So Marv sees this as another sign from God. 
And he basically creates like a makeshift shop where he uh, lives in it and fabricates Aww. and alters the dozer into his killing machine. Aww. Yes, he now has privacy. He can work. Uh, so Travis and his business would work during the day. And when they shut down, Marv is when he would uh, get into action. Oh. Mm-hmm. Very, very, uh, um, what do you call it when you plan? Um, P- planner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, he's, yeah. he's planning. He's, yes. He's, he's, uh, uh, everyone's yelling. I hate, you know, when you listen to a podcast and you're like, you're yelling at the host because you know the word. That's what's happening no. right, right now. Right to us. Mm-hmm. Right to us. <laughs> Premeditated. Oh, God. Uh, that's the word. Okay. Prem- oh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, so working at night for a year, Marv builds the following. Uh, he used quickcrete concrete to sandwich sheets of steel together to form an armor. The concrete is 5,000 PSI, which means it can withstand 5,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Wow. The armor is surrounding the entire dozer, except the tracks, uh, where in some, place, in some places, the armor is a foot thick. What? Yeah. So, you do remember... you need a foot? Do you really need a <laughs> foot, Marv? Yeah. So, can you do me a favor? Can you take a look at this damn thing? I would love to. And describe what the kill dozer looks like. All right. Now remember, this thing is thirty feet long, uh, and it's covered in cement. Okay. All right. So it looks like <laughs> I don't even know. It looks like something you would drive to Burning Man. Yes. <laughs> it's very. Uh, uh, it's very German. Like it's got these harsh lines. It's got. Uh, it just looks like a big concrete tank. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It looks like a tank and a bulldozer had a demonic baby. Yeah, and that baby is going to eat your brain. Like it's, <laughs> and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt real, real bad. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's just very unattractive. And there are no windows, which is very yeah. bad for you, uh, for your yeah, mental. We're, we're going to talk about why there's no windows. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear. Yeah, so there's no windows, exactly, no portholes. Uh, it is a solid block. Of concrete, solid block. We're go- we're gonna have to post a picture of this. Yeah, on it's, it's gonna at some the killdozer and all of the damage Marv did will be on the Instagram. Uh, but yeah, definitely watch the watch the amazing Netflix documentary Tread. Uh, Netflix sponsor us. Um, <laughs> okay, where are we? So the casing made it absolutely bulletproof and even small explosive explosive proof. Um, there were no portholes, as we said, uh, because that's a weak spot. Marv had an entire year to think about weak spots. Um, uh, so how the hell did Marv see? He installed several video cameras outside wow. and around the, uh, the cabin, uh, wired to monitors inside the cabin. Wow. And the cameras were protected by clear bulletproof Lexan, which I guess is like a plexiglass that's bulletproof. He even thought of fans and air conditioning. Uh, from what I remember, the exhaust to the fans and the air conditioning, he thought about flashbangs and he thought about if the police gas him, yeah. like the airways would go around the cabin and outside. So all of that would be, it wouldn't affect him Yeah, because he, he thought about that as well. Now I have to say like, there is so much science and creativity, yeah, intelligence, like, Hard work, a lifetime of hard work, working on other things was put into creating this vessel. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say vehicle, but it's, as he liked to put it, vessel. Um, it's such a shame because if he had put yeah. all that, you know, uh, those powers to good, he could have done some cool stuff. He, uh, you know, he, he could have gotten, I was going to say he could have gotten into the business of making kill dozers, but that's a bad idea. <laughs> Please don't do that. Yeah. Instead um, of going to the fucking Thunderdome. Jeez. Yeah, geez, it is very Mad Max. Okay, so there were, oh, actually there were three portholes, but there were three gun portholes <laughs> aiming through, so three holes through the armor fitted for a 50 caliber rifle, a 308 semi automatic, and a 22 LR rifle. Now, here's the eerie goddamn. I mean, this is all fucked up, but. 
the eerie part is the the so once Marv closed the hatch, he couldn't get back out because the hatch was so heavy. He had to close it with a crane. He had to lift the hatch with a crane what? and close it. So, so he, oh. he knew he was in. He was doing a kamikaze. Okay. Yeah, he knew that he was not going to get out of this. It's a bummer. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, it's yeah. a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On June fourth, two thousand four, the self-proclaimed American patriot shaved his head, entered the cabin, closed it, and the self-proclaimed wronged man rammed through the walls of the building where he had worked for over a year and onto the street, heading for his first target, the Dochef Concrete Factory. Uh, Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, it doesn't. None of this makes sense. (laughs) I want to make that very clear. None of this makes sense. But in his mind, I can see how that would be. Yeah, I mean, it's right across the street. It's literally right across the street. Yeah. On June 4th, uh, that was a work day. So the factory was operating and filled with employees. Marv slams into one corner of the building and outlines his way around the foundation, taking down wall, hitting one corner, making a left, taking down that wall, until the building collapsed in on itself. Wow! Uh huh. Luckily, this estimated 84-ton vehicle moved slowly, because it was so fucking heavy, which allowed time for people to evacuate. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, and basically stand helpless as uh, this all unfolds. Uh, in front of them. Cody is on site uh, and he even tries to fight Marv with his own dozer. <laughs> so oh my god, he has a dozer too! Yeah, he has his own machinery but it's no match because Marv's vehicle is so heavy from the slabs of steel sandwiched by concrete. It's not going to happen. Marv doesn't even budge. And with this opportunity, with Cody so close, he starts firing his rifles at Cody. Yeah. What? But by some miracle, Cody gets away and he's not harmed. Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the cops arrive and they shit themselves. Uh, yeah. And like any cop, <laughs> <laughs> and like any cop, they don't think; they just start shooting. And of course, this does nothing because look at the goddamn thing. Yeah. It just causes more panic and more of a scene that draws out the public. So there are bystanders everywhere. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh God. Yeah. Just watching. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, again, watching the documentary. There's footage of people just watching what's happening slowly. <laughs> no, slowly. That's what I, I, I again, I don't slow. love anything about this, but like, I can just imagine it. it's basically in a slow, slow motion. disaster. Um, uh, yes, indeed. The people of this small town watch helplessly as a fucking tank basically rolls over cars, trees, and even trucks, actual trucks on its <laughs> oh way. God. On its way to Main Street. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Marv takes Main Street. Uh, Mars Vendetta leaves, leads him to the town hall. Okay. Destroys right. that. Oof. The offices of a local newspaper that he says editorialized against him at some point. Destroys that. Mm. The home of the former mayor. Destroys that. A hardware store owned by another man named in another lawsuit at some time he Meyer filed. Uh, destroys that. Uh now, these are all just my words coming out of my face. Do you want to take a look at the destruction? And would, would you like to describe to. I would love to describe this small town. Now, remember, this is a small town out west, so these buildings, they're not skyscrapers. They're maybe, they're a story, two stories at most, and they're built with, like, fucking um, aluminum siding, uh, your low-grade concrete, drywall. I will I will say as I... As I... 21 year old uh yeah. when i was living in texas i got drunk one night and i got home yeah and uh i realized i'd left my keys at, at the bar so i i did what any nice southern girl would do and i kicked in my own door and it was so easy because you know that's some parts of the country it's just <laughs> i did tell that story uh on this <laughs> podcast but um it's just that easy but it's just that easy uh, up here in new york it, things are a little a little more tough, but I'm looking at like uh, the city hall yep. right now. Um, it just, it looks like someone just pushed it down. Yes. Just like from the roof, just with their hand, squished. like a giant hand just squished it down. Yeah. Like a little all, kid in a, in a building a sandcastle, just squishing it. Squished it down. And then all of the windows are gone. Yeah. Which is crazy. Uh, it looks like. I'm looking at some cars. Uh, 
Yeah, the police Totaled. cars. Yeah, he uh, he went for police cars too, and so the police had to like get out of the way. He uh, yeah, he uh, oh god, he was on a mission. He oh, was on yeah. a mission. The newspaper office. Wow, it Shell. looks like a tornado hit it. Yeah. It looks like a tornado hit it. It is turned into the shape of a triangle. No idea how he did that. <laughs> it's art. <laughs> that one was art. Yeah, the hardware store is a pile of uh, you never You'd never think that was a store yeah. at all. I'm looking at a service truck. It looks like a, like a, what are, what do you, a transformer picked it up with their hands and then crushed it into a ball. Yeah, it looks um, like a, like the toy transformer, uh, but it didn't make it to its transformation. <laughs> exactly. Um, I will say the front of the Martin, uh, the Mountain Parks Electric uh, did pretty well. It looks pretty tough. Yeah, just the facade is gone. Just the, it just looks like someone took a little bite out of the front. Mm. It's probably made out of cake since that's going around Twitter. Everything's made out of cake now. Yeah. That's very specific. Yeah, so please take a look. Enjoy. Well, oh, God, please don't. Delete, delete. Don't enjoy that. Don't enjoy. <laughs> don't enjoy. But um, uh, look at it. Find and, interest in it. Learn from it. God. So in two hours and seven minutes, Marv plowed through 13 buildings, knocked out gas service to parts of the town, he actually shot at gigantic propane tanks, uh, supposedly to set off an explosion, but luckily he failed to. Uh, the cops are failing as well, um, as they're just basically file. Uh, uh, they're they're still shooting at it for two hours and seven minutes. Um, their flashbangs and their smoke bombs are funneled away thanks to the cabin and the fan system that Marv built. Uh, in fact, the only thing that stops the killdozer is the killdozer itself. Oh, my God. Yes. Now, while smacking into the Gambles hardware store, Marv turns a corner and accidentally uh, dips into the basement of the shop. Oops. Uh, yeah, a lot of... built. It's rare for buildings out west to have a basement, uh, but the Gambles hardware store had one, so he didn't expect that. And he maroons himself in a ditch, basically, and he's too heavy to back out. There you go. Oh, my God. So, Marv realizes this is the end. This is the end of his killdozer rampage. He Meyer takes a 357 handgun, puts it to his head, puts it into his mouth, and he shoots. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's over. Marv is dead and caused $7 million in damage to the town of Gransby, Colorado. And somehow, he's the only one to die or be physically injured believe it or not. Now, the fate of the dozer, it's dismantled to prevent souvenir taking, and Marv is cremated and his ashes are released uh, where he and his Thursday crew would gather Aww. every Thursday. So his friends still saw him as a friend, despite losing his mind. I think it's clear it's mental illness yeah. that um, played a big hand in this. Uh-huh. So. Oh, yeah, but... I mean, there was mental illness, but he also many times said it was wrong. Yeah, and yeah. not saying he's a, a a good guy, but definitely, I think a little mental illness sure. or a lot of mental illness <laughs> to play here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you think all of this would be huge news? I mean, this is one of this is a hell of a hell of an incident. Um, but a day later, Reagan dies, and it just occupies the headlines, the death of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. So everybody forgot about Marv. Uh, well, not everybody forgot about Marv. Oh. Yeah. Now, I know what you're thinking. A straight white man who feels he's owed something by a society that he says marginalized him and uh, clearly did him wrong in some fashion. Uh, is he seen as some kind of hero? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. Oh. Now, not only did... Not only did Marv leave uh, two hours of audio, uh, he left some written notes as well. And one note left by Hemeyer states, <clears throat> quote, Sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. Oh, God. <laughs> Someone's going to get a tattoo of that. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. A tattoo or maybe uh, a series of memes. Really? Yep. So these words become memes on the Internet, and it becomes a slogan for the far-right extremist boogaloo movement. Oh, God. Oh, uh -huh. face on the hand. Yep. The slogan, I became unreasonable, is one of the taglines 
for incel, white, I don't even want to call them men, but uh, Marv becomes a hero to uh, a part of society that's very, uh, we've seen them. They're, they're, that's horrifying. We've seen them. They're uh, armed and ready to protest masks and all need haircuts. Oh. Yeah, so sorry, everybody. This, yeah. This uh, story took a turn, but... Instead of learning, you know, from this, yeah. we're, we're going to be yeah. worse. <laughs> 20, ah. 2020. Uh, yeah, so please watch the documentary. Uh, take a look. Uh, and, yeah, educate yourself that this is a uh, length some people will go to because they they just feel like they're wronged. And if you're journaling anything that seems remotely violent... There are so many websites, <laughs> phone numbers, therapists, yeah, psychiatrists. We're here for you. We're here. For right to us. Right to us. <laughs> for the um, love of God. We, we don't have training, but we can direct you in the right place. Uh, yeah, take a look over your journals and, and hmm. check with yourself. Yeah. Check in with we yourself. We got you. We got you. We got you. Well, that's interesting. Pod at Gmail. Uh, enjoy our Instagram. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's fun. It's delightful. And gorgeous. It's gorgeous. So many facts. Uh, write in. Support this podcast. There's a link at the, uh, um, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, uh, in the summary section, there's a link where you could support us. You could be a sponsor. Fuck it. Fuck That's yeah, right. I don't yeah. want to start a muffler business. I can't no, do that. No. Uh, Me either. Stay interesting, everybody. Please do.